Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 10L of Useful Genetics, where we're going to be talking about mobile DNA. We'll talk about it in the context of the question, why are our genomes so big and why is so little of it our genes? And the answer is that our genomes are full of what are called mobile DNA sequences or mobile genetic elements that are able to create not just more copies of themselves, but of other sequences as well so that all these sequences accumulate in our genomes. And in this lecture, we'll talk about the DNA transposons that are partly responsible for this. And in the next, we'll talk about RNA-based processes and consider the overall consequences for the functioning of our genome. So this is a um, figure from Module 2, where we compared genome sizes. And I'm showing it again just to remind you how much bigger eukaryotic genomes are than they would be expected to be based on the number of genes that they have. We have 10, 20, 50, 100 times more DNA depending on the species than we need to code for our genes. Why is this? Here's, um, in contrast, it doesn't need to be that way. This is um, the a short segment, about 10 kbs, of some closely related bacterial chromosomes. And the arrow lines are genes. And what is immediately noticeable is how little space there is between the genes. The genes are snugged up close. There's a few longish gaps, but mostly they're packed in very tightly. But when we look at our own genome, a much bigger segment, 60 kb, can only fit in one gene, and that's because even within a gene, there's all of this extra space full of DNA that isn't doing any coding function. Here's um, the other diagram that we've looked at several times showing the distribution of different kinds of sequences in our genome, with only 2% of the genome coding for proteins, another 26% coding for introns, and the rest being sequences that aren't really doing much of anything for our functioning. Now, we do understand why all this extra DNA is present, and there's two explanations. The first is that some mutational processes, simple mutational processes, such as the slipping by DNA polymerase at VNTR repeats, these processes are biased so that they more often generate longer segments than shorter segments. So we mentioned when we talked about VNTR alleles that they more often get longer by, by DNA polymerase slippering than get shorter. And over millions and millions and millions of years, even small biases accumulate like compound interest, gradually making the genome bigger and bigger and bigger. So this explains the presence of um, simple sequence repeats in our genome, and simple duplications too, which also arise by DNA polymerase errors. However, most of the rest of the genome, including most of what's in our introns, falls into the category of what's often called selfish DNA. And it's called selfish DNA because it's DNA that doesn't exist in the genome to benefit the organism. This DNA is only there because it can increase its own abundance. So many segments of the DNA in our genome code for proteins that can make copies of the segment that encodes them and insert this, these copies into other places in the chromosome. And then natural selection acts on these within the genome as if the genome was an ecosystem and it favors the segments that are best able to replicate. So our genomes fill up with these molecular parasites. That's really what they are. They're using our genome as an ecosystem, and they're increasing as best they can. And they're held in check by selection on us, on our ability to survive and replicate. If we get too much of this DNA in our genome, our genomes won't be able to function, and we'll die off. 
That's not a very elegant functional explanation, but we think it's right. Now, how many copies are we talking about here? A lot. So here again is just a segment of that diagram of the kinds of repeats. One kind is the ALU repeats, so the blue lines. They're about 300 base pairs long, and there's more than a million of them in our genomes. Short interspersed nuclear elements. They're, again, some of them shorter than ALU repeats, some of them longer, more than 100,000 copies. Line elements, long interspersed nuclear repeats, they're bigger than 4,000 base pairs, and there's more than 10,000 of them. LTR retrotransposons, we'll talk about retrotransposons in the next lecture. They're long, they're about 6 kb long, there's about 4,000 copies in our genome. And then the simple sequence repeats that I just described make up about 3% of our genome. These are things like VNTR loci. Now, here's another slide from Module 2 on how genetic elements insert. This is a very simple schematic showing that the element comes, a copy comes along, breaks the chromosome, and it inserts in. Now, this is shown in more detail in the next slide for DNA transposons. These are the kinds of uh, mobile elements that are encoded in DNA and that function as DNA. DNA is directly synthesized and then inserted into its new location. So these elements have an open reading frame, a gene. That's basically, they consist of a gene and recognition sequences at the end. And the gene encodes a protein called a transposase, and the transposase recognizes the sequences at the end of the element and takes them as a signal to make another copy of the DNA sequence, including the ends, and to insert this segment into a new location in the chromosome. So the old copy stays where it was, but a new copy is inserted into the chromosome or another chromosome at a different place. So now there are two copies of this element, both encoding the transposase that can copy it and make more. Now, the transposase will act on anything that has the ends sequences at its end that it recognizes. So not only will it copy versions of the transposon that carry an intact transposase gene, it'll also copy defective elements that have defects in their coding sequence, but as long as the ends are recognizable, it will make a copy of the whole element and insert it into the chromosome. So as long as a chromosome contains some elements with functional transposase coding sequences, it will make more copies not only of these, but of defective elements as well. In fact, it'll make copies of any sequence that has the recognition sequences at the end. And so our genomes fill up not only with intact transposable elements, but with defective elements and other sequences with the recognition sites at the end. So we've considered the problem why is our genome so big? Why is so little of it used for genes? And the explanations are in part that mutational processes such as DNA polymerase errors have biases, probably accidental biases, causing them to favor longer sequences and that this acts like compound interest in making our genomes larger and larger. But these are only a small fraction of our genome, a much larger fraction comes from the action of genetic parasites, DNA sequence elements that can make more copies of themselves and insert them into new locations in the genome, and also make copies of other sequences and insert those copies in the genome, back in the genome as well. So here we've discussed DNA-based elements. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about RNA-based elements, and then consider to what extent we really should consider all of this extra DNA to be junk. I hope to see you there.